I'd like you to go with me to 1 John chapter 2, please, in the New Testament. For those that are new to the Lord, you may want to keep your finger in the index of your Bible because we're going to be moving through a fair amount of Scripture today. I'm going to speak to you about the spirit of Antichrist in the Christian church. The spirit of Antichrist in the Christian church. Let's pray together. Now, Father, I stand here only as an oracle, only as a vessel in your hand. This message is on your heart. Lord, you want to speak this to your people. And I'm asking, O God, for the grace. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you quicken my mind and physical body, my heart. Lord, animate me. Let me never speak this type of a word out of any passion of my own heart. I pray, God, with everything in me, that the passion that would exude from this vessel, if any, would be a type of the passion that's in your heart for your people. And Father God, I thank you that you're going to open truth, and the truth will set your people free. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. First John, chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. John starts with a curious statement. He says, little children... It is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that this is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. John says there were many... Antichrists. Now, it's an incredible thing, a, a statement, really, in the first generation church that John said there were people with us. They had the same access to Christ that we have. They had the same access to truth that we have. And but they went out from us and in, they had a message that was really in the Greek. It's antichristos, which means it's instead of Christ. It's a message that is a substitute for Christ or it actually means it's opposed to Christ. And John says, we know that this is the last time. We know that the time from the, when, when the, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to the day that Christ returns, there are many that have gone out, John says. And they had an opportunity to believe and to walk as we are walking with the Lord. But instead, they have a substitute Christ that they are bringing to the people. Now, in chapter 4, if you'll move ahead, just one chapter, uh, two chapters rather, chapter 4. Uh, John further defines this spirit of Antichrist. He says, Beloved, in verse 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, folks, this, this saying is just a little bit deeper than somebody saying Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That does not, if, if somebody, we have false prophets today that will stand and say, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. There, I, I am a, a man of God. But they don't understand really what that's about. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and I have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. And so, really, John, let's start at verse 5, and we'll work our way backwards through this message. John's identifying the theology, this Antichrist theology that makes inroads through every generation into the Christian church. The theology emanates from the deep and corrupted inner cravings which dominate the fallen world around them. And John says it this way, they are of the world. They speak as the world speaks. They think as the world thinks. Uh, now, the, the definition of the world would be those uh, who are fallen and without the knowledge of God. And they relate to these people. And because they relate to these people, these, the world hears them. This, their theology is, is based on inner corruption. That they will attempt to put religious garments on and sanctify it and bring it to the people as if it's the voice of God speaking to the people. Now, the Apostle Paul had issues with this. Actually, most of the New Testament writers had to deal with these issues. Paul would establish a church, and very shortly after, the church would come to Christ and the knowledge of Christ and be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. False teachers would come in, 
with an attempt to lead them away into the substitute Christ or the substitute theology, which is opposed to Christ. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let me just read it to you, verses 19 and 20. Paul's speaking to the Corinthian church. And he says in verse 19, he, he said, For you suffer fools gladly, seeing that yourselves are wise. And Paul is in effect saying to the Corinthian church, You're allowing fools to come in and teach you their concept of Jesus Christ. And in your, because you have set your wisdom above the knowledge of God, or above those deep inner promptings of the Holy Spirit that come to those who are truly His children, you have allowed these fools to come into your homes. And beloved, many today in the Christian church, you do go to a solid church, perhaps, if you're visiting today or you're attending Times Square Church. And you do uh, worship in a place where the Word of God is opened and, and you hear truth and truth can set you free. But you go home and turn on your television and you allow fools to come into your house. People with a substitute Christ who are opposed to the very knowledge of God that can set you free. And you say, well, I'm smart enough to know. What is good and what is bad? And I've, I don't know how many times I've heard this. I heard a group of preachers say one time, oh, we're smart enough. We can chew the meat and spit out the bones. Have you ever heard that saying? Well, I found in the last few years their mouths have been full of bones. They haven't been smart enough to know what the meat is. And they've hung on to the bones and spit out the meat. And, and beloved, you've got to be extremely careful, especially in this generation that we're living in. That You do not open your house to fools who are preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 20 in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, You suffer, or you're allowing, if a man bring you into bondage. Now, Peter the Apostle in 2 Peter chapter 2 defines this. And he says, These are men who preach from the corruption of their own spirit. While they promise liberty, they themselves are the slaves of corruption. In other words, they are the slaves of their own depraved, actually in the Hebrew uh, uh, Greek, rather, it says they are the slaves of their own depraved inner nature. And they are taking that inner nature and they are bringing it to the people of God and they are entangling them again with the pollutions of the world after God's people have been set free. They are coming to the people of God with gospels that say it's God's purpose that you only ever be rich, you only ever be happy, you only ever be healthy, and all the rest of these things. This, these are deep inner cravings of the polluted nature, trying to dictate to God the way the Christian life is supposed to be. And they bring the people into captivity. While they promise liberty, they themselves are the slaves to this inner corruption. They have another God. They have another focus. Their, their whole essence or sense of fulfillment and happiness is in how much they possess and how much stature they hold both in the world and in the Christian community. Paul says, you suffer if a man devour you. Jesus himself in Mark chapter 12 condemned, derided the Pharisees. He said, you, you love long robes and you love salutations in the marketplace and you love to be called teacher, teacher. You love the finest seats at every banquet. And he says, but you devour widows' houses and for a pretense you make long prayers. In other words, there's nothing you won't take from anybody to further your objectives. If a widow in her desire, in a sense, to please God, comes and offers you her whole house, you will take the whole thing. You'll take your possession. You'll take bread out of children's mouths so that you may further your ministry objectives. And Jesus goes on with even deeper condemnation for these things. Paul says, you suffer if a man take of you. If, 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 if the whole objective of his ministry is contrary to that of Christ who came and gave himself for us. And he, if a man comes and, and takes of you, all he does is continuously take of you, take of you, take of you. Paul says, in your apparent wisdom, you suffer this, you allow this foolishness into your home, and here you end up as even a supporter of this foolishness. If a man exalt himself, Paul says, you suffer it. All of the self-exaltation now that goes on in the name of Christ in ministries and pulpits all over the world today. And what a blind ministry sits under them not seeing that the spirit that animates them is not the spirit of Christ. Let this mind be in you, the scripture says, that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul says, this mind is to be your mind. But Paul says, you suffer if a man, you, by the word suffer, I mean you allow it, if a man exalts himself. 
If he declares himself to be God's man of the hour, if he declares himself to be some great prophet, you suffer it even though this is antichrist. Even though this spirit is opposed to the spirit of Christ, and which has been taught to you, you allow this into your house. And then again, Paul says, you suffer if a man smite you on the face. That's very interesting. Uh, if you'll go with me to John chapter 18, please. I believe that this will show us what Paul is actually speaking about. John chapter 18, Jesus is being held before the high priest. And his servants. And he's being questioned about his doctrine. In John chapter 18 and verse 19. The scripture says, Then the the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered him and said, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them with heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answer thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him and said, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Paul says, You allow if a man stands and smites you on the face. And you see, this organized religion will always despise the simplicity of Christ. Jesus is answering these men. And he says, you want to know what my doctrine is? Well, he says, my doctrine has always been in the open. It's, it's, it's totally out there for public scrutiny. I have said nothing in secret. Everything is open. The people have heard and understood, to a large percentage at least anyway, what I have said. And he, and he was presenting before them a contrast to their own religiousness. Because they had agendas that were secret. They had hidden issues of the heart. Many, I'm supposing, on that council wanted preeminence among the people. Even their plot to put him to death. They said, we're going to lose our place and we're going to lose our nation if we don't do something about this. More concerned, the scripture says, about the praise that comes from man than the praise that comes from God. And here comes Jesus standing before them. The Son of God incarnate, a man, God Almighty himself. And he says, no, I do what I do in the open. I do what I do. I say what I say for the examination of all. I have never hidden anything as you are hiding everything that's in your heart and attempting to do. And here is a man standing before organized religion who is finding his life by being lost in the identity of another. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, he said, I and my father are one. This is the simplicity of Jesus Christ. He is finding completeness in the will of God. John 4, 34, he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He's finding joy when others, when others are being benefited by his sacrifice. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Here's the simplicity of Christ. Oh, beloved, you see, the pathway that Jesus walked is the pathway that we're to find. We're to find our life by being intertwined with the life of Jesus Christ in us. We're to find our completeness in the will of God. God has a will for every person who's sitting here today. You're not here by accident. You weren't saved by happenstance. The moment you came to Christ, there was a plan that began to be unfolded in your life that only God Almighty Himself knows. And finding joy ultimately when others are benefited through the sacrifice of our lives for the purposes of God. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul says, I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Back in 1 John chapter 4 verse 3 again. John says, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist where you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Any spirit, beloved, which does not lead the believer to an understanding of his or her completeness by faith in the finished word and work of Jesus Christ is in itself opposed to the cross and is an antichrist spirit. Any spirit that does not lead you to the completeness of Jesus Christ, any spirit that purports to speak for God but points you in any other direction but Christ. John the Baptist was a man filled with the Spirit of God. And when Jesus Christ came on the scene, 
He not only pointed out Christ, but he encouraged his disciples to go after him. Follow him. This is the Christ. Follow him. If I am a genuine preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, my objective in ministry is not to draw to myself, nor even to this church, but to draw you to Jesus Christ, to open to you the fullness of the life of Christ that is yours, and to speak to your heart and say, let God speak to you. When he speaks, obey him. Follow him. Where he sends you, go. Do the will of God for your life. This is where you will find the life of Christ. This is where you will find the will of God. This is where your life will amount to something that is a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God and reasonable service. Colossians chapter 2, please, if you'll go back. Colossians chapter 2 in the New Testament. Verses 8 to 15. Paul says it this way. Beware. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10 says, And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and all power. Paul says, Don't let somebody spoil you. Don't let another theology come into your house. Don't suffer the theology of fools. He says, your life is in Christ. He is the fullness of God. Everything of God is in Christ. And if you are Christ's, Christ is in you and you are in Him. And you are complete. He in Him. He is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And Paul's just saying simply... When you put on Christ, to put on Christ means a putting off of the old nature. When Christ is in you, you begin to change. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things begin to pass away. Behold, all things are made new. And as we behold him, we are changed, the scripture says, from image to image and glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 12 says, we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Yes, we identify with his death. We come to him acknowledging we've sinned against God. We need a savior. We say we are dead, O God. There's no hope in us to change. There's no hope in us to find your will or become anything that you want us to be from any power of our own will or our own reason that operates within in us apart from God. But as Christ was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God, so are we raised from the dead by the same Spirit. And we are risen with Christ. We sit sit with Christ, Paul says, in heavenly places. We are co-inheritors of everything that Jesus won for us on Calvary 2,000 years ago is yours and it is mine. I'm a co-inheritor with Christ. He is the head and I'm part of his body. As he is raised from the dead, so I am raised from the dead. No longer to operate in the lower regions of my nature. No longer to be led by the passions of my flesh and the reasoning of my natural mind but to be led by the Spirit of God and to be brought into the power of an endless life, a supernatural life that God Almighty Himself will live out through me only for the reason that His name might be glorified through my life on this side of eternity. There is no other reason. Otherwise, He should just take me home this very day. Being dead in your sins, verse 13, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has quickened together with Him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Isn't it good to know that you're forgiven this morning? Isn't it good to know the devil has no list against you? If you are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, there's no record of sins. God says through Isaiah, I will even cause myself to forget. I will not remember your iniquities anymore. And not only is my sin blotted out, verse 15, he says, But having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus Christ destroyed every power of evil that could ever hold you or I down, that could ever keep us from becoming everything that God intended us to be, not only in our salvation, but the witness that God wants to establish through us on this side of eternity. That's why John says in First John, in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, we've heard that 
verse many times, haven't we? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we often equate that verse with combating sin or combating some of the suggestive things of Satan that comes against every child of God. But really the context of this verse is protection from that Antichrist spirit. The deception of the devil that always wants to come with a gospel that is opposed to Christ or a substitute for Christ, a counterfeit Christ. And John says, no, you're not going to be taken by this because you've already overcome these arguments because you have someone in you that is greater than anything that is in the world. You have Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. We are not called to just come to Christ and then just figure out all of this truth by ourselves until we get home to eternity. No, we have an interpreter that's come. We have the power of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit has come now living within us. And in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, John says, You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now the word unction is charisma, and it means a communication and a reception of the Spirit. If I can put it in clear terms, John says, You have the ability yourself to hear from God. You have the ability to hear from God. You don't have to run around the world looking for a word from God. You have the ability to hear from God. You have the Holy Spirit within you now. You have Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. That's how you can overcome any of these deceptive spirits that will be literally unleashed against the church in the final hour of time. I have Christ in me. I have the Spirit of Christ in my life. Not just as my Savior, but the Holy Spirit has come. And He is my comforter. He is the Spirit who leads me into truth. I have the ability to hear from God. Everyone in this church today, you can hear from God. Did you know that? You don't have to run to some meeting and have somebody else interpret God for you. You have the ability to hear from God. You have Christ who sits at the right hand of all power. You have the Word of God. This is God's love letter to you. This is the mind of God. You have the full mind of God in your hands. You have the Holy Spirit given to you by God Almighty Himself, who comes down as the Spirit who leads into this truth, and not only leads, but has the power to make this truth a reality in our minds, hearts, and lives. I can hear from God. And you can hear from God. Let me tell you how the Antichrist spirit works. Antichrist ministers have to create an ambiguous God who speaks only in vague whispers, who's mysterious, who just kind of floats through the service. You know, the Bible says there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But you see, these men, Jesus himself warned, he said, in the last days, men are going to come and they're going to say, I am Christ. Now, there's there's three forms of this. There are people who are absolutely deluded who stand up and say, I'm Christ. And they're fairly easy to identify. There are others who will stand and they'll say, if you're looking at me, you're looking at Christ. I am Christ. This is Christ. But yet their lives might be an anti-Christ. It might be opposed to the very spirit of Christ. And then there's a third category. You see, Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And these are the ones who create ministries where they have to become the interpreter of what God is thinking and saying for you. Oh, what are you saying right now, Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit's got something for you. Come to the altar and I'll tell you your future. It's nothing more than fortune telling, folks. That's all it is. It's anti-Christ. I lead you to Christ, but you have got to hear from God for yourself. You've got to hear from God because you have the ability to hear from God. Everyone. You don't have to run anywhere. You don't have to go to anybody for a word from God. You go to this book and say, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. Lead me, guide me into Christ. You have an unction. This is what John is saying to the church. There are many antichrists got out there. But you don't have to be deceived because you have an unction. You have in you the ability to hear God's voice. And he says, you know all things. 1 John chapter 2.20. The word know in the Greek text is to perceive with the mind and understand. The word things 
means all things that came into existence through Jesus Christ. And it includes the individual within that totality. Now, that's, that's very fancy definition, really. But let me put it as clearly as I can. You know who Christ is. You know who you are in Christ. You can hear him calling you towards everything that he's called you to be in himself. That's what John is really saying. You have an unction. And you have the ability to understand the total plan of God and where you fit into that plan. That God has made a reality in your life through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. That's why he says in verse 27, The anointing you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. Now, many, many over the years have used this to be rebels in the, in the body of Christ. I don't need any man to teach me. I've got the Holy Ghost. But the context of this verse means you, you must not let any man's teaching lead you outside of Christ. Outside of the Word of God and outside of the Holy Spirit's revelation of His promises to you. You must not put yourself under the ministry of anybody who claims extra biblical revelation. You must not do it. You must not let yourself be taught by these types of people. This is an anti-Christ spirit. It's opposed to Christ. You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. You are complete in Him. He sits in power. You are, He is the head, you are the body. His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ is in you. His Word is in your hands. You have everything you need in Christ. You have the ability to hear Him. So many people in this generation just run to church every Sunday. Oh God, I've got to hear from you. And God says, what's wrong with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? I am here only to lead you to the one who can speak to you. And he governs your life. So many people, we get them even here that have have spent 10, 15 years of their Christian life on a spiritual goose chase. Because somebody somewhere gave them a word. You're going to be a great healing evangelist in South Africa. And they spend 15 years just trying to get a ticket to get there. To fulfill their destiny of greatness. And it's only fortune telling. Or manipulation. At best, at best it's manipulation. Of God's people. It's a spirit other than Christ that animates them. And I feel like Paul, how long will you suffer these people? I know I'm speaking to some here. I, I'm absolutely sure of it because the Holy Spirit would not put this kind of a word on my heart. To say, how long will you suffer these people to come into your house and teach you another Christ? A Christ that whose only objective for your life is to make you into this great person that fulfills this great destiny. That's another buzzword. In the last several years. Destiny is never servanthood or jail. It's always greatness. Ruling, governing, rich, powerful. Not like Paul. Rejected, despised, imprisoned. That was his destiny. And he was appointed to suffer by God. Not very many people speak about that anymore. Try to preach this foolishness that is emanating all over the Western world. Try to take it to Vietnam today and preach it. Where pastors are driven from their homes, their children are taken away, and they have to flee into the jungle and trust the local villagers and God to feed them. Try preaching half of what's preached in American pulpits today in these places. It can't because it's not the gospel. It's another Christ. It's a Christ that is cultivated and fashioned very craftily, like the golden calf was at the foot of Mount Sinai, for a people who, a society who just wants to pursue happiness. And so they've, they've crafted their Christ. And they have their prophets now that stand and mutter and peep in his name. Because that's what the false prophets in the Old Testament always did. They never had a clear word. They could only mutter and peep vague sentences because God didn't speak to them. And so they had to speak out of visions of their own heart. One false prophet was in here in New York uh, in, in 2001. I believe it was July. Or in, in, walked down the streets of Manhattan on television saying, Oh, judgment will never come to New York City. God loves New York City. Two months before the towers were hit. False Christs. Another spirit. 
Beloved, if ever, if ever the church of Jesus Christ needed wisdom, it's today. Needed to just stop everything, turn it all off, get on our knees and say, Jesus Christ, my Savior, my God, speak to me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. God, I want to know what it is that you have for my life. I want to know what it is that you're speaking to me. I'm tired of the running. I'm tired, oh God, of turning on knobs and all the confusion that's coming into my life. All the fools that are sitting in my living room talking about Jesus Christ. God, I'm tired of it. And folks, everybody who comes to Christ has to get through this, this, this gauntlet of confusion in the Christian church to find Jesus. John 16. Jesus said it this way. In verse 13. He said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes, he does not have a word that is different from the word of God. He does not have his own agenda. He is not walking in disunity with the Father and the Son. There are three persons, but only one God. And God is not divided against himself. When he comes... Jesus is saying it very clearly. There will be many who come. The inference, I suppose, can be drawn from this. And they will say, this is the voice of the Spirit speaking, but you can't find what they're saying in the Word of God. No, He will not speak of Himself. But whatsoever He shall hear, He shall speak. And He will show you things to come. And it's interesting, because in the, in the uh, Greek text, the word to come means things that are put in motion from one place to another. He will speak, He will lead you into truth. And he will show you things to come. Now, I don't believe it's just talking about revelation for the future, that New York City is going to be judged or anything like that. Now, these things can be part of it. I think it's personal. He will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will lead you into this truth and say, yes, you are maybe a selfish man, but I'm going to show you how generous the Spirit of God is going to make you. And he will show you in your own life things to come. He will show you that uh, selfishness leaving your life. And the the very love of God that causes you to give for the sake of others begins to emanate through you. He will will take you from where you are and move you into something that is only of God. He will show you things to come. That's what makes reading this Bible exciting. Do do you live in a supernatural world with Christ? Do, do Do you wake up every day, open this Bible, not just to get through your five or six chapters that you, you methodically have to read before going to work, because, of course, everyone's supposed to do their devotions. But do you read it saying, Holy Spirit, show me what's to come in my life. Show me where you're taking me. Show me what you're doing through me. Show me how you're crafting the nature of Christ within me. Show me, God, what I'm going to be 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, 5 years. Just show me, God, what you're doing and help me by faith to believe it. Peter says we're giving, we are given exceeding great and precious promises. And by these we become partakers of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. It's through the promises of God. Holy Spirit, show me. Oh, folks, I have lived this and I live it even today. I know what I'm talking about. Coming into the Christian church, the Christian life so far behind, but yet opening the Bible and seeing what God said He will do, what God said He will make me. Teach me to be a, a husband to my wife and a father to my children. Teach me to have compassion when my heart was as hard as a stone. And He showed me things to come. And I have known, I've proven that He is faithful. And in my heart, there's no longer any limitations on God. It's God, you can do whatever you want to do. Take me wherever you want me to go. Do whatever you want to do through my life. All I ask is that you be glorified. Be glorified. Let it be Jesus that is seen. Let it be Christ that is heard. Let it be Christ that is formed in an intense desire in the hearts of those who may hear your voice emanating through this human vessel. Let there be a burning in the hearts of the hearers for Christ once again. The Scripture says the men on Emmaus Road were confused. But Jesus walked up beside them and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded in the Scripture the things concerning Himself. And He said, Oh, slow of heart to believe. Do you not understand that this is the pathway the Son of God had to walk on? He shall glorify me, verse 14, John 16, for he shall receive of mine and show it to you. Here I have inherited all the resources of heaven, Jesus said, are mine. 
And the Holy Spirit will come to you and He will open this book and He will show it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. And therefore said I that He shall take of mine and shall show it to you. This is amazing. Everything that I have, everything I am, everything I've purchased, it's yours. And the Holy Spirit will be like a, I don't know, a jeweler in a jewelry store. He will just unveil. He'll pull back if they had a, a, a cloth or something. And he'll, he'll just unveil the treasure of Christ. And you'll be able to stand and you'll say, it's all yours. It's all yours, whatever you want. You can have it. You want love? It's yours. You need long suffering? It's yours. You need peace? It's yours. You need to hear the voice of God? It's yours. You need strength? It's yours. You need whatever you need. It's yours. Because you have found Christ. You are walking as Christ was walking. Your will is locked into the will of God. You are finding your chiefest delight in having your own identity swallowed up by a new identity which is given you through Jesus Christ. Your will is locked into the will of God. You say, God, you've done so much for me. All I ask that I might follow you and that you might be glorified through my life. And as you begin to cry out to God, He begins to show you His heart. He begins to reveal to you human need. You see, false prophets can't go there because there's nothing in them. They're greedy. All they want is everything in your wallet with great promises of liberty that's coming to you and great visions of things that are going to happen through their ministry. All they're after is you. But Paul the Apostle said to the Corinthian church, I don't seek you. I don't seek what you have. I, I, yours, rather. He says, but I, I, I'm after you. I'm after your heart. He said, I've, I presented you. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul says, I, I'm trusting that by the power of God, I will be able to live for you for no other purpose but to see you brought to this deep inner knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul, we go on f- f- more fully to say, Lord, my, my will is locked in your will. And now you are re- revealing and releasing your heart through me to meet human need. You see, this is the work of God all over the world. If, if all the seeking of God does not bring us... T- to the place of entering into the compassion and work of Christ, and it's for nothing. There's really no point to it. We have a massive move in the Christian world today, in the Western world, that is going in the opposite direction of Christ. Is They're using Christ as a vehicle for self-improvement in every level of that. They've, the whole relationship is backwards. For Christ says, no, I've, I've called you that I may flow through you to human need. Wherever you are, be it in your own family, your own neighborhood, your own country, your city, your world. John says, in Second John, he says, if anybody, he says, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not, in verse 7, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. He said, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that you receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. And he abides that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, and neither bid him God's speed. In other words, don't, don't bring him into your house, and for goodness sakes, don't support his ministry. For he that bids him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. There are people here today that have had little or no victory because you've been following voices that aren't leading you to Christ. To know Christ is to know victory. I, I don't know how else to say it. If, if, I, if I could, I'd, I'd come out into the congregation and sit beside everybody who's here, annex every room. I'd plead with you. There's a simplicity in Jesus Christ. To know him is to know victory. To know him is to know the one who has all authority, who has vanquished all the powers of darkness. To know him is to know that I am free now to change. I'm invited to change into the very image of Christ, the the very nature of Christ, by the power of Christ in me. I have everything in this book that I will ever need. Everything in the mind of God is in this book for me. I have the Holy Spirit to interpret it for me and make it real and apply it to my situation. The voice that I follow has been leading me to Christ for 
27 years now, leading me to Christ. A deeper, fuller abandonment to Him. Taking me out of weakness and wrong thinking. Putting in this body a new mind, as He says He would through Ezekiel. A new spirit, a new heart. These are the evidences that I am in Christ. His, his life, His passion, ultimately and obviously equated towards other people, is being realized, is being formed, and is beginning to flow. I have found along this Christian journey that there is no power of evil that can withstand the life of Christ in me. There's no besetting sin. There's no besetting mindset. There's no counter-argument of the devil. And not even false theology that has tried, as it has tried with many here, to come and divert you into another Christ, has been able to stop this life of victory because the Spirit of God is with me. To find Christ is to find a new life that is freed from the dominion and power of sin. That's what it means to find Christ. Old habits die. If you are finding Christ, if you are, if you are, if you are following the voice that is leading you to Christ, you'll find freedom from sin. You'll find the power of sin is broken. Not only the penalty when you come to Him, but the power of it. You don't have to live under its dominion any longer. There are promises in this Word. And by these promises, we are brought into the freedom that Christ won for us on Calvary. We're not saved to have a religion. We're saved to have a living relationship with God. We're saved to glorify God by allowing Jesus Christ to make us into new creations that are made into much more than we ever could be without the Spirit and the power of God as a testimony to everybody else who comes behind us. Hey, what God did for me can do for you. That's the Christian life. That's the simplicity of Christ. It's not complicated. What He's done for me and doing for me can do for you. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's all you have to know to stand and preach to any crowd anywhere in the world. That's all you have to know. You have to know Him in simplicity, a living testimony, that He is changing my life. He's broken the power of sin. He's giving me a new mind. He's given me hope for the future. He's taken away the pain of my past. He's taken me to where only God could take me. He's given me giftings and abilities that I have never possessed and would never possess without Christ. That's all you need to know. And Paul says, I'm afraid lest you be converted from this simplicity. To find Christ is to find both the will of God and the power to perform it. The will of God. God begins to speak and says, Husbands, I want you to love your wives as I love my church. He not only speaks about His will, but He then gives the power to perform it. It's amazing. Then you know, like you know, like you know, like you know in this Christian life. I know my Redeemer lives. I know it, you can say. That becomes your testimony. You come into the house of God and you're not waiting for the band to hit the right note so you can get into the worship thing. You're coming in and you've walked all week with God. You've been changing from image to image and glory to glory. You say, I know, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my God is in me. I know the miraculous power of God. I've not come to get something. I've come to give Him thanks. I've come to praise Him. I've come to shout His name from the rooftops. I've come to say, I love you, I trust you, I invite you, mighty God. I invite you, mighty God, to use my life for your glory. I invite you, God, to love that unlovable person through me, to give through these selfish hands. I invite you, God, to be God through me. This is to find Christ. And to find Christ is to find an inward power of love, which causes you and I to be released willfully to meet the needs of others. That's what it means to find Christ. Religion will slap your face. Religion will hate that simplicity. It's an inward power of God's love. I believe it's the ultimate evidence. If whether or not I'm really in Christ. What must I do, the lawyer said. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Or let me say it this way. The second is proof of the first one. That you love your neighbor as yourself. You can take these two and hang up all the law and the prophets on it. These are the two truths that are evidence that you love God. To find Christ is to find this inward power of love. I never cared about anybody in any large way, except for myself, before I came to Christ. 
I was a police officer. You, mo- most of you know that. I used to be able to go to accident scenes and draw chalk lines around bodies. And then go and take a takeout lunch and go and eat my lunch. It didn't even bother me. You get hardened. You get used to death and depravity. But when I found Christ, I found an inward power of love which causes me to want to go wherever God says go and causes me because of his compassion to want to reach out to people that perhaps others may not want to go to. This love of Christ has led me into maximum security prisons. Inmates will never get out. It's led me into prisons for sex offenders. It's led me into Hindu Muslim prison one time in South America. It's led me to places that I never would have believed I'd ever be on Indian reservation one time in northern Canada, sitting on the roof of somebody's house, praying, (laughs) because that's the way they do it. I remember shaking my head saying, God, I never would have believed I'd ever be here. If it weren't for you, if it weren't for your love to be in this place, it was almost like hell on earth. 1,300 people, one shower, houses all broken down, windows smashed up because of the alcohol and the violence. To ever be there, you, you have to have the love of Christ. Not just a theology, not just something about God, but the actual presence of God with you. I believe there's many people here today that just need to say, God, let me hear your voice. This is the cry I felt the Holy Spirit had on his heart when he gave this to me. This has been a very difficult message for me to preach today. But I I felt the Holy Spirit saying, I want to speak to my people. But they need to get the fools out of their living room. Need to open the book and pray again and begin to read and say, God, every line, show me Jesus Christ. Show me your will for my life. Guide me. This is really where Christian victory is. It's not in some happy meeting and some great destiny. It's finding Christ. And allowing his life to become your life. And there's no other way that's going to happen, but you have to hear his voice. I can't do it for you. It's like when a baby's born, the doctor can slap his behind, but the baby has to breathe. No amount of exterior coaxing is going to make a difference if the child doesn't breathe. And that's the way it is. You can, you can go to church services and meetings and, and all of these things, but you... And I have got to get to the place where we say, God Almighty, breathe on me. Speak to me. Guide me. No matter where it is, if, 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 you, if you want to take me where I'd rather not go, it's proven conclusively that this is the pathway for many in the Scriptures. God, take me. I, I yield. Just all I ask is I want to hear your voice. I'm, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of, I'm tired of it all. I just want to hear your voice. I want to hear you speaking to me. I want to hear you guiding me. I I need to be free. And there's others here today that just need to be free from the besetting power of sin. If you will honestly come to Christ, he will set you will not only forgive you, but he will set you free from that besetting power of sin. And I'm believing God for that this morning with all my heart. You know, there's some here this morning. You've never heard the voice of God before. And you've come to church this morning, and it's just a little bit different. You, there's a, you're not hearing an actual voice, but there's this deep inner prompting that's saying, I know God is real. You see, that's God speaking to you. I, I know God is true. This is the beginning of you, beginning to experience that drawing of God that will lead you into the life of Christ. Now, you can never hear his voice if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. If you don't understand that he died on the cross to pay the price for your sins 2,000 years ago, took his penalty, the penalty you deserve, he took it upon himself. What he requires of you is a heart that says, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry that sin put you on a cross, and I don't want to live in sin anymore. In this day, I thank you for opening your arms to me and dying in my place, and I give you my life. The Bible says if that's a deep inner cry of your heart, he will forgive your sin. He will cleanse you from all the unrighteousness of it. And you will enter into a brand new life, not here, not just for here, but for all of eternity. Now, this morning, if you're here and you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior for the first time, whether you're in the annex or in main sanctuary, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. 
going to ask you unashamedly just to raise your hand with me right now if you want to receive him as Savior. All over the sanctuary, balcony, main sanctuary, at the, at the altar. Raise it up high. Just raise your hand high. You want to receive him as your Lord and Savior today. God sees your hand. God sees every hand in the balcony all the way through downstairs. And he, we're going to pray together now. Let's, let's pray and believe God. All this church together. Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. Jesus, I thank you that you came to this earth and went to a cross and paid the price for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. And I don't want to live in sin anymore. Thank you for saving me from an eternity in hell. Living apart from the love of God forever. Lord Jesus, you opened your arms to me and offered me salvation. In this day, I open my heart to you and I receive this offer of salvation. And I say, oh God, forgive me and come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you are receiving me this moment. That you're giving me eternal life. And you are going to lead me by the Holy Spirit into the very life of Jesus Christ. Who is now my Savior and my Lord. Jesus, you are my Lord. Jesus, you are my Lord. This very moment and for the rest of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Amen. And for those who came to Christ, we have a new believers class every Friday night. Please make an effort to go out and be part of that, and we'll help you get started in your walk with God. Now, for the rest that are here, you want to hear God's voice. You want to hear Him leading you. The most important decision next to your salvation that you will ever make is to hear God's voice. But are you prepared? Are you prepared to let God lead you? This is the question. You know, some people just want to hear the nice things. You know, let me hear your voice. Oh, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Oh, that's so nice. How about I'm sending you to Africa? How about you've come here from a foreign country and uh, you know the culture and I'm calling you back home to your people. You came here for the good life, but you found Christ. And this is your good life now. And I want you to take this back home. You see, you have to be open for everything. The full spectrum. You can't be selective. God has to be able to speak to every area of your heart. Do you, do you want that? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I am here as your servant. And I say like Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Don't let me be led. By any other voice, the voice of my own heart, or any substitute voice, any other spirit, but the Spirit of God. I ask you, Lord, to speak to me, lead me, guide me, and let my life glorify you from this day and for the rest of my life. Now, Lord, I believe. I'm asking you for bread. You'll not give me a stone. You'll give me the Holy Spirit in great measure to lead me into truth that your life might become mine. And I thank you for this. And I believe it. And I receive it in Jesus' name. Now thank him. Thank him with everything that's in you. This is the conclusion of the message. 